Good morning. Welcome to Convocation. Uh, before we welcome our speaker this morning, we have just a couple of announcements. Hey friends, just a quick SGA update. Um, can I actually get the free printing slide pulled up? Awesome, yeah, so there is now free printing for students in the CAD and the library. Uh, this was possible thanks to Shirley, Greg, Amber, Dan, Renee, and Barb, so we really appreciate um, those people and departments working with us on this project. Paper will be provided, um, copying is free, just enter the code 7777. Um, and then if you have any trouble with the printers, like it's jamming or something like that, please go ask Amber or Shirley or anybody on this list to um, help you unjam the copier. Let us know if you have any questions. Thank you. Hey guys, my name is El Pedro. I'm the Secretary of Student Activities Council. As you guys might have seen, I sent out an email for the sendogram. So you can only send two, like one Bethel student can only send two. Um, it's going to close on Wednesday at 12 p.m. So please sign up before Wednesday at 12 p.m. if you want a gram to be given to your friend, girlfriend, boyfriend, anybody by Friday. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, this morning we are very excited to welcome Paula Miller. Uh, to say a little bit more about Paula and her work, uh, I wanted to welcome a student up to the stage. This is a student who introduced us to Paula Miller. So I will let her say more about Paula's work and I'm excited to hear so uh, welcome Kelly Habegger. Hi. Um, so have you noticed something we lost years ago in listening to your body and what it craves or ignored your hunger and restricted yourself from consuming treats and sweets just so you keep yourself what others see as healthy or fit. Our speaker today is going to reveal information that might contradict what you've been told since you were young. I strongly recommend you listen in and think about yourselves and your bodies. Trust me when I say this, she will challenge your thinking about what you've been told about your eating, your bodies, your physical and mental health. Oof. Um, Paula Miller is an award-winning dietitian who loves Linder chocolate herself. In her weight-neutral, size-inclusive practice, Sunrise Nutrition Counseling, Paula passionately helps individuals challenge harmful nutrition uh, beliefs, reclaiming joyful, intuitive eating, and finding peace with food and body. Her greatest satisfaction is helping her clients let go to embrace all food, ending chronic overeating, undereating, and binges. As a teen, Paula owned disordered eating tendencies, leading her to study nutrition in college, obtaining a bachelor and master's of science in, what, dietitians? Dietetics. I never heard that word, but cool. Um, she currently teaches basic nutrition and joyful eating principles to college students, speaks to audiences about loving all food without guilt, and I mean like fast food as well, not just, you know, salads, just saying that, um, and helps individuals, uh, individual clients struggling with disordered eating and eating disorders. In her sessions, Paula offers clients freedom to diet from diet culture with her scientific knowledge of nutrition, along with this evidence-based information also, she also brings real world experiences from her own disordered eating past, her varied patients, patient experiences, and her role as a mom feeding two young children. In her spare time, Paula enjoys time in nature walking or gardening. She enjoys beautiful sunrises and sunsets, which is hard not to love, um, attending occasional yoga classes and savoring tasty food with her husband, a chef. Please join me in welcoming her to Bethel College. Thank you, Kelly, for that wonderful introduction. Um, like she said, my name is Paula. I've been a dietitian for almost 18 years. Um, I have had lots of different experiences in the field of nutrition. Um, I was in the Army, and I was an Army dietitian for three years, working in inpatient and outpatient clinics. Um, I've worked for home care and hospice. I've worked for the Women, Infants, and Children Nutrition Program. So I'm 
kind of a specialist in a lot of things, and that makes me able to teach um, college nutrition classes pretty effectively because we touch on lots of topics. Um, today, uh, as a dietitian, I'm bringing you something different than the science of nutrition because my, like I tell my college students, the first half of the semester we talk about the science of nutrition because there is a science to nutrition, but that takes the soul out of food. And so we don't stop there, okay? So the second half of the semester, we talk about the psychology of eating and feeding, which is actually much more powerful in people's lives. And that's part of what I'm gonna bring you today, okay? So to get started, what I find is that I, I, I currently am specializing in eating disorders and disordered eating. And, uh-oh, I find that people don't even realize that they are engaging in disordered eating behaviors. Um, and so I want to first educate you on that so that you can, you can understand what disordered eating is, okay? So our eating happens on a continuum. From food is not an issue on the left side of this continuum where you are someone who goes to the table hungry, you choose from whatever, whatever is provided on the table, you eat, you feel satisfied, and you leave, and you <coughs> stop thinking about food until the next time it's time to eat again, until the next time you get hungry, okay? Someone for whom food is not an issue acts in that way. If somebody, like you, go home and your mom bakes you some cookies, you might eat some of those cookies, um, you might continue eating those cookies because they taste so good, or you might stop eating those cookies because you know you can have more tomorrow. Super flexible, okay? Someone who is flexible about eating and enjoys what they eat and eats due to satisfaction, that is normal, healthy eating, okay? Someone who is concerned in a healthy way might be someone who's pretty flexible, but they also consider nutrition when they're making their choices. However, it doesn't take away their enjoyment of food. Um, they, don't have, they don't feel guilt when they eat, okay? When we get into the middle, so those two I would say are intuitive eating, which is a model, of, a model that I use with my clients. When we get to the middle, we talk about food preoccupation or obsession. This is when people start to follow the keto diet, or they start to follow a paleo diet, or they try to completely avoid sugar, and they do that for a while, and then they have something sugary, maybe they go to a party, um, or they're at a social event where they have something sugary, and they kind of just eat everything else sugary because they've blown their diet. Those are the behaviors that begin to be um, in this food preoccupied or obsessed arena, okay? Um, we also have disruptive eating patterns, okay? And so this would just be even more of that dieting. Um, this might be somebody who fasts for long periods of time trying to, shape their to change their body's shape or size. Um, so lots of different disruptive eating patterns can come into play. So those two, the free pr food preoccupied and the disruptive eating is what I would call disordered eating behavior. That is different than an eating disorder, okay? Disordered eating is seen as normal in our culture. It is not normal. It is not a healthy way to be. Um, and it, it's really harmful to people's health. But we don't realize that because diet culture is so loud and powerful. It's a $72 billion industry. Okay? So I really try to help people that are in these two areas move up towards the intuitive eating, making peace with food direction. Okay? So then next we have an eating disorder. Can someone just call out what's one eating disorder that you know of? Anorexia nervosa is one. What's another one? Bulimia. Bulimia nervosa. Okay. Another? Binge eating disorder, which is, which is actually the most prevalent type of eating disorder, okay? Kind of like bulimia, they will eat large quantities of food, feels kind of out of control, but they don't um, try to purge it, okay? Um, what's another eating disorder? <coughs> what did I hear over here? Purging. purging, okay, so there's purging within some of those that we just talked about. Avoidant restrictive food intake disorder is one. That's where people eat a very limited amount of foods, typically because they've had an experience where they may have choked when they were young, and so they have a lot of anxiety around eating. Orthorexia, I think, is the one in our culture that people don't realize. It's, it's, um, 
it's not a diagnosable, it's in the eating disorders not otherwise specified, that is an intense focus on only eating healthy foods or foods that are clean or foods that are pure. Okay, that's an eating disorder as well. Okay, so I want you to look at these, three, these four pictures. Two of these individuals have an eating disorder. I want you to tell your neighbor, who do you think has an eating disorder? Pick out two of those and, and see if your neighbor agrees. <laughs> All right, so tell me what your neighbor thought, okay? Show of hands, whose neighbor thought this was an eating disordered individual? Okay, not very many people thought this one was. What about this one? Okay, a few hands. How about this one? Okay, maybe a few more hands. And finally, this girl. Okay, the answer is the two in the middle. So do we see this type of person have an eating disorder in this kind of a body? Yes, but less frequently than we see someone in this body, okay? We have this idea in our culture that eating disorders look like this. They do not in the majority of people. And that's why they are so often missed by doctors um, and other healthcare professionals. So you cannot, you cannot determine by looking at a person's body how much psychological distress they have around food and eating and body image, okay? Did anyone pick up on this person and this person being the same person? She is a contestant from The Biggest Loser. Here is her before picture from The Biggest Loser. Here is her after picture. In her after picture, she has what we call atypical anorexia nervosa. Why is it atypical? It's actually the most frequent type of anorexia. So it's all the same symptoms as somebody who is in a, a really skinny body that has anorexia. However, they just are not underweight. That's the only difference. Okay, but they undernourish themselves. They have a lot of psycholo psychological distress around food and they start to have some of the subtle signs of malnutrition, which your normal family doctor or pediatrician will probably not pick up on, okay? Often patients who are undernourished and dealing with something like atypical anorexia will go to their doctor and they might have kind of a lower heart rate and they say, oh, I'm, I'm running, I'm active. You know, that's why it's so low. Well, no, if it's in the 40s, you're undernourished, okay? And doctors will not pick up on that. Um, so she, through The Biggest Loser, The Biggest Loser is a horrible show for health. I will tell you that. We have looked at people's um, health status prior to the show and after the show, and they actually were healthier in larger bodies, um, both psychologically and with some of the um, like cholesterol, blood sugar, et cetera, those things, okay? This gentleman has binge eating disorder, and so he's pretty vocal about his struggle with that. So my point is that you cannot tell by looking at a person's body what their relationship with food is like, okay? So body image, that comes into play with what I'm talking about because if we would stop feeling like our bodies are a problem, and if media would stop and diet culture would stop telling us that our bodies are the problem, we wouldn't feel like we had to, to change what we eat. And that's where our relationship with food gets messed up. So body image is the perception that a person has about their body and the thoughts and feelings that resonate with that perception. Why is this important? Because that is the best known contributor to anorexia and bulimia. Okay, body image. Um, for children who are taught to restrict their intake, an eating disorder is more likely than sustained weight loss, okay? So all these parents who are trying to control what their children eat, which your parents might have done, more likely is an eating disorder than losing weight and maintaining that weight loss. This is what research tells us, okay? So just like the eating issues continuum, there's also a body image continuum. Um, people who are in the green area with body ownership, they really don't care what media says about bodies, they're fine in their body, 
They're okay with their body. They don't feel bad about it. Those who are in the body acceptance range might feel like, oh, you know, I'd like to change this about my body, but overall I'd focus on what I really think is good about my body. I'm thankful that I have legs that walk, and I, you know, they look at the positives, even though there might be some things they want to change. Someone who is body preoccupied or obsessed is someone who begins, who starts looking in the mirror a lot, or every time they pass a car, they kind of look in the window of the car at their reflection, um, those kind of things. They, they walk into a room and they compare their body to other people's bodies. That would be someone who begins to be body preoccupied or body obsessed, okay? And then we have the distorted body image and the body hate or dissociation. This is where people will not even feel like their body is theirs. They're so disassociated from it, okay? So why does poor body image happen? What do you think this baby is thinking about his belly? Do you think he's thinking, oh my goodness, I need to lose this thing, what is this? Probably not, right? So we are all born with bodies that we don't hate or we don't dislike. But so we all have a body story, we all have a body image story. And so somewhere along your growth, Somebody or culture or media has told you that your body is not okay the way it is. And to have a positive body image in this culture, it takes work, okay? Um, so why does poor body image happen? Lots of different reasons. Your family can be a big part of that. So warning, okay, there's a few pictures of people in undies. I'm just making sure Bethel College students are mature enough to handle that. Um, I did this presentation one time and I really surprised a guy in the back and I was like, okay, gotta add a warning. So here's your warning, right? So why is body image such a struggle for us? Um, media presents the thin ideal. So media presents most bodies as looking like these bodies, okay? Very fit, very thin, um, but bodies come in a range of shapes and sizes. And so accepting that is part of the reality. And realizing that when you go to media, and I think your generation is, is more aware of this than my, gen my generation, when you go to media, most of what you're looking at is photoshopped or edited. You guys are putting stuff out on social media that is edited, right? So everything you're looking at, if you go to social media and you feel bad after you, close, after you walk, walk away from it, you need to curate your social media because you can go to social media and follow the right accounts and leave it feeling good, okay? And so I help my clients do that because this, um, this is the reality that bodies come in all shapes and sizes. So what if you were to reject this fantasy for the reality that all bodies are good bodies? Okay, consider that. So now that we know what eating issues look like and what body image issues look like, how do we find peace and heal from that? There's two methods that I use with clients. Um, one of them is intuitive eating, which is a model that's becoming a lot more popular in popular media. But what you need to know about intuitive eating is a lot of people have co-opted it and used it as a Come, I'll teach you intuitive eating and you will lose weight. That's not making peace with food. Trying to change our shape and our size is not making peace with food and body, okay? Um, so I, as I work through the 10 principles of intuitive eating with people, we work on letting the body figure out its best shape and size and not fighting it, okay? So intuitive eating, there's over 100 research studies on it. If you're interested, I would encourage you to get this book. They're coming out with a new um, edition in June. So with intuitive eating, we do not focus on specific foods and we don't specific focus on um, specific diets. We get in tune with hunger and fullness and satiety. So we see that with intuitive eating, people have higher self-esteem and better body image. Um, and more satisfaction with life, kind of all of these things right here that you can see. 
okay, even better cholesterol levels, lower triglyceride levels, we see their health improve, okay? So first principle in intuitive eating, this principle is a real struggle for a lot of people in our culture because the diet industry, like I said, is a $72 billion industry and they want you to believe that you can lose weight and maintain that weight loss. 95% of people cannot and good scientific research tells us that. So we are, they are out there selling diet products to people, telling them that you can lose weight, which they can. We know how to help people lose weight. We do not know how to help people maintain that weight loss. So this graph shows you what happens with most people. So most people will start a diet, and you can see on here, these people started a diet somewhere around 17, okay? So they're dissatisfied with their body. Diet culture tells us we should be dissatisfied with our bodies. So they go on a diet, they lose weight. They get to their goal weight and they stop that diet. And for 95% of the people, like I said, they start to gain that weight back. 20 to 60% of people won't just gain to where they started. They will gain more than, than where, what they had lost originally. Okay, so that's 20 to 60% of people. So then they're dissatisfied with their body yet because they couldn't maintain that weight loss. They blame themselves, not realizing that it's not their fault. Diet just restriction does not work biologically. So they'll go on another diet, and this process just continues throughout their life. So people end up larger because they are trying to restrict their intake. We have good scientific research that shows this, okay? So rejecting the diet mentality is the most important, not the most important, it is a huge important part of intuitive eating. So principle two and principle five are a place I spend significant time with people. Honor your hunger, feel your fullness. Okay, my kids are really good at honoring their hunger and feeling their fullness. We were at the state fair and my daughter said, okay, I'm full and this is what was left. If your parents, when you were this age, saw that much food left, what would they tell you? <laughs> Eat it, right? Finish it. I never tell my kids that because I want them to be able to retain that feeling of comfortable satisfaction and fullness and by not forcing them to eat, even the last two bites of something, they are able to continue to honor their body, okay? If you lived in a house where parents told you to finish your food or clean your plate, you probably need to do some work with intuitive eating, okay? So here on the left, you can see the hunger scale that I use. It goes from zero to 10. The blue area is where I try to help clients to stay. This is not a diet. Um, we are making peace with food. So I try to encourage people to stay between three and seven, okay? So I'd like to eat now, but I can wait if needed. Okay, some of you might be there right now. A slightly empty stomach. Five is neutral, not hungry or full, but just satisfied. Six is a slightly full stomach, and seven is comfortably satisfied. So when I ask people what hunger feels like, a lot of times they'll tell me, oh, headaches. I feel, I get a headache, or I get nauseous, or I start shaking. That is actually starvation, or extreme, I should say extreme hunger. That is extreme hunger. And that extreme hunger causes a chemical in your brain to kick in. The chemical is called neuropeptide Y. And that chemical is the chemical that protects our bodies from starvation, okay? We have these inc incredibly complex bodies. And that chemical, so in the caveman days, when they would run into a berry bush, they would start eating those berries and they would not stop when they were comfortably satisfied because that chemical was telling them, you gotta keep eating because this is, there's some kind of a famine happening here and you gotta eat as much as you can right now. So if you are someone who ends up down here frequently, maybe you skip breakfast, you eat a light lunch, by the evening, I bet it's hard to stop eating when you're comfortably satisfied because that neuropeptide Y is, has kicked in and is keeping you eating and munching and munching, okay? Um, so down here, a little too full, uncomfortably full, maybe you have to unbutton your pants or you're glad you wore 
um, leggings that are stretchy, that you know, can stretch with your stomach. Um, this, this typically is described by most people as not a comfortable feeling, but when they have been starving themselves, they, that neuropeptide Y will cause them to go here, okay? Um, so we work a lot with that. All right, principle three is make peace with food. Think about the foods you feel are bad or unhealthy or the foods you feel guilty for eating. Okay, those feelings actually make us eat more, not less, according to what research tells us. So just like I showed you with my kids with the, the um, corn dog, I don't make them eat past comfortable satisfaction. I also don't restrict foods like brownies and cookies, et cetera. Um, we have them at a meal or at a snack, but I don't restrict the amount they can have because I know that's just going to make them want more. So this was an event uh, we went to, it was called Dessert First, it was at lunchtime. My kids had not eaten, um, so when we go into the Dessert First event, they get to choose from whatever is on the table and they get to eat until they're satisfied. So what do you think, what would your parents say if they saw you with this plate full of food when you were little? No, right, they might take it away from you. Um, they say, maybe you can have a couple pieces, but we're gonna save the rest for later. When we see kids who are restricted, they, I, I see the kids come to my house who are restricted and they'll sit at the table at a birthday party and have another piece of cake while everybody goes and plays, okay? Because I don't restrict kids in my house because I know it's not the right thing to do. So people often think, if I don't restrict my intake, I will not stop eating. But what we see is this principle of habituation come in, okay? How much does she eat there? Like a couple pieces. She poked holes in most of the pieces of food. <laughs> but a hungry child went to this dessert first event, filled up her plate, and her mom didn't say anything. I'm not gonna give her shame about food and she ate until she felt like she'd had enough, okay? So, this, is a, this can work with you too, if you've been someone who's restricting. It will, not, it will feel scary and it will not feel like it's working when you're doing it, and you may need some professional support like myself if you've been restricting food for a long time. So, there is a psychological principle called habituation. Think about the last time you got a new phone or you got into a new relationship. Okay, you wanted to use that phone all the time or be with that person all the time or whatever, but over time, what happens? It becomes not as exciting. It's still nice, right? But not as exciting because um, you have gotten used to having it in your life all the time, okay? And so that happens with food too. So I work with clients who have been restricting food to bring food, these foods back into their lives and find peace with them. Okay, and it, it can happen. So when we don't make peace with food, that's when we see overeating and binges happen. This is a little girl that um, is a friend of ours and in her house, her family restricts their intake of fun foods. Um, and she went to the event and went home like this because it, she's gotta get it when she can, right? And so we see adults do this too if they're restrictors and they go to a party. They wanna eat as much as they can then. Okay, so a few more principles of intuitive eating. Principle four would be challenge the food police. Food police are everywhere. They could be your parents. They could be your person you're dating, okay? They're people who tell you you shouldn't eat what you're eating. Um, they are definitely diet culture, okay? The keto diet would be the food police. They're telling you you're not supposed to have certain things. So we challenge those food police. We discover the satisfaction factor. So think about when you go into your cafeteria today for lunch. How do you choose what you're gonna eat? I really work with people to be able to go into a space and not make themselves eat a salad because they think they should eat a salad every day, but to realize that some days, that because of satisfaction, they're going to want a salad, and some days they're going to want a burger, okay? We see that people who eat for pleasure and who are in tune with satisfaction and in tune with how, how those foods make their body feel, 
they actually eat a more varied diet than people who try to follow the dietary guidelines. Okay, again, research-based. This is research-based. Uh, principle seven, cope with your emotions without using food. So we've really villainized emotional eating in this culture. Um, some emotional eating is normal. It's when people are using food all the time to deal with um, stress, right? I was a stress eater in college. Anybody in here a stress eater? I feel like college caused me to stress eat, right? So if that's the only way you deal with your stress, then I would be like, okay, let's figure out some, some other coping mechanisms, okay? Um, <coughs> happiness. We can eat because we're happy. We can eat because we're depressed. We can eat because we're celebrating. There's lots of emotional reasons to eat, and it's okay to eat for those emotional reasons. But if that is the regular for you, then it's important to start learning some different ways to cope with those emotions. Okay. Uh, principle A, it would be respecting your body. Um, this is things like wearing clothes that actually fit. There's a lot of people who have grown out of some jeans that they wore in high school and they keep them around because they say, I'm gonna get into those someday. That's not respecting your body, okay? Our bodies change throughout our life. And so part of that is having clothes that fit well, um, treating your body, taking care of your body, okay? Principle nine would be exercise, feel the difference. So if you're somebody who goes to the gym and exercises and you don't enjoy it, I would start to ask yourself questions about that. Why are you doing that? What's your motivation? So too many people have connected exercise to changing their body's shape or size, and that makes them not enjoy that movement, okay? There are so many ways that movement can feel really good if you pay attention to it, but if you're always trying to change your body with your movement, you're gonna lose your steam on it at some point, most likely, okay? So exercise, feel a difference. For some people, not moving is an important thing to do for quite a while until they feel ready to start doing it and start tapping into the other parts of movement that will make their body feel good, okay? Um, and then principle 10, honor your health with gentle nutrition. So I'm a dietitian. I have a bachelor's and a master's in nutrition. I know the science of food, okay? So food does affect our bodies in different ways. But if we are changing our nutritional intake and it affects our enjoyment of food, it's not going to last, okay? So when I talk about gentle nutrition with people, we can know nutrition principles and use them in gentle ways. Let me give you an example from my own life. Um, I like to have, I like to heat frozen corn up in the microwave, and I would put a pat of butter on there with some salt and pepper. Um, and I was like, well, you know, olive oil's a unsaturated fat, why don't I try that? So I started using olive oil, and it tastes just as good. It does not take my enjoyment of that food away, and so I use olive oil instead of butter. Okay, so I'm using the science of nutrition, but I am not taking away from my enjoyment of food. Um, cookies, I use butter, because if you try to make cookies with oil, it does not taste good, in my opinion. Okay, so if I was making my cookies with oil, I would be impacting my enjoyment of those cookies. So I don't make that change. Okay? Um, so, if you are interested in knowing more about this, this is such a fast 30 minute talk on this topic. Intuitive eating can take a long time for people to learn, um, depending on the length of time that they have deprived themselves or their parents have deprived them. And so if you are interested in learning more, um, I send out a monthly non-diet newsletter, which will um, challenge you in your thinking and I'm also available, my website is there if you're interested in talking. I do a free 15 minute consultation with people who are interested in potentially working with me if they are um, interested in asking questions, I do that. Um, so my contact information is here. Those can be scheduled directly on the website. You don't even have to call or text me. Um, I guess I'm ready for questions if... Yeah, <laughs> Paula, yes.
yes, we do have time for a conversation now, so I'm sure some of you have questions. As always, happy to pass around the mic, but if you prefer to submit a question through the Google form, Ronald is sending that out as well. Hi, thanks for talking today. This was really interesting. Um, I'm hypoglycemic, and I didn't know if you had any particular experience with working with people with that condition, any like general things you found that are helpful for that, because like, I won't go into a bunch of specifics, but I tend to swing pretty wildly from being too hungry to overeating because of my blood sugar varying so much. Yeah, so, so when I talk about intuitive eating with people, I talk about how they typically feel hunger somewhere between every two to five hours. Um, and a lot of people who are like, oh, I don't get hungry that often, ha their body stops telling them they were hungry because they hadn't listened to it. I would treat hypoglycemia the same way where it's like every two to five hours you gotta be having food to eat. You know, and there's a lot more I could say on that topic, but um, that awareness of what your body's feeling like <coughs> and when you're starting to feel hunger is really important. Because hypoglycemia often happens when people are not taking that time to eat. Yeah, because I'm pretty busy. It's hard to eat yep. often enough. Yeah, so for people who are starting out with intuitive eating and have skipped meals for long periods of time, I encourage them to set an alarm. Okay? Every three hours, I would set an alarm. And this is the conte contextual, is what we call it, the contextual part of eating. So breakfast, lunch, dinner, let's form a plan and so we can sit down at those times with food that we are going to eat and maybe take a bite and decide if our body, how much our body wants at that time. Thank you. You're welcome. A uh, question submitted online. What is your opinion on intermittent fasting? Um, so when someone's doing intermittent fasting, I would like to ask them a lot of questions about why they're doing that. Um, are they doing it to shape their to change their body shape or size? It's most likely just going to end up like every other diet, where if they do have weight loss, they're probably going to see it come back within. We see it come back within two to five years. Okay, most weight loss research follows people 18 months, and that's why they're saying weight loss works. Weight loss works because they don't follow people to the two and to five year mark when they gain the weight back. Okay, intermittent fasting. I really encourage methods that cause people to return to the trust in their body. We have hormones. Ghrelin is the hunger hormone. Leptin is the fullness hormone. We have hormones to tell us how much to eat, okay? When you're doing a method that takes you away from trust in your body, you're potentially entering that disordered eating phase. I would also ask yourself, how do I feel when I do intermittent fasting? I talked to a guy recently who said, you know, he was asking about intermittent fasting. He said, I just feel so bad when I do it. But he continued to do it because that's like the fad thing right now. Pay attention to how your body feels, okay? If your body feels great on intermittent fasting, maybe there's something in that for you. But if not, consider what you're doing. Um, so most eating disorders are found in um, young adolescents. How come we're not targeting that conversation more towards kids that are from the nine to 14 age? Um, they're actually, uh, so eating disorders pop up during that time. They op also pop up during the premenopausal period. And why don't we target more there? I mean, all of the research is done there. That's why we think that's where, like it's females. I don't know if I'm answering this question the best. So. I mean, I, I am trying to get the message out about these eating disorders, but diet culture is so powerful that it is an opposite message. So we can do what we can, like I'm working to educate people and there's other really good eating disorder professionals who are working to educate people. But like I said, diet, the diet industry is so powerful that parents believe it and restrict their kids. I don't know if that's the, the best answer, but I could talk with you more, more about that. Hi, it's Rex Green. Thank you for coming and talking. It's good to see you again. 
Um, I have a question more. What, how do you deal with people who are more textual eating, especially with like kids that won't eat because of different textures, like with autism? How do you deal with that? Um, so I would want to see that person and ask them a lot of questions first to determine if it's truly a textural issue or if it has been a pressure from parent issue in their life. Um, so I want to know the difference between that. If it's truly a textural issue, they can be referred to like an occupational therapist who does that type of therapy. Uh, question submitted online. As a dietitian, how do you feel about vegetarian and vegan diets? Um, so they can be really well balanced if they're planned well. I would really um, ask someone why they're doing that. That can be a really big flag indicator of an eating disorder. But they definitely can be planned well um, and can be a positive thing for someone. I would just wonder what their motivation is. Yeah, so, so peace with food is really important. And if the diet is to change body shape or size, there's red flags. If it's an environmental thing or something like that, you know, there's reasons people can do it health, healthfully. Hi, uh, thank you for coming today. I appreciate your presentation. So I asked this question, how, do, how does an individual overcome overeating and not feeling, like, how do they, you know, not feel healthy without restricting? Does that make sense? How do they not feel? Sorry. How do I overcome overeating when I'm hungry all the time? If I never feel full, how do I stay healthy without restricting? Okay, I need to ask you a lot of questions, whoever you are. Um, I, well, and, and you guys laugh, but it's really true. Like, what does that feel like for this person? That, are they, where are they feeling hunger? What does hunger feel like? If hunger is in your mouth, your tongue, your jaws, or your throat, that's most likely an emotional hunger, okay? So where is their hunger really at? So we need to explore that deeper to be able to figure out what's going on with you. Have you been restricted from food from your parents? Have you dieted? A lot of that can just cause you to want to eat all the time. There's a ton of psychology involved in, in eating. Hi, thank you for talking to us. I have my, my mom has been, so she's a cancer patient for 12 years now, and she's on a keto diet. Um, and for years I've been trying to do research around that and find out if it's actually beneficial for a person like that or if it's struggling to help her. She's in a stable place, she seemed happier, she seemed better about it with her body, she seemed like she can do a lot more now than she could when she was on a normal diet. So is that a bad thing or do I try and push her away from that? I think that if she feels peaceful around food, she doesn't feel guilty, she doesn't go to avoid social events to follow her diet, I think it's an okay thing for her if, if she truly has this healthy, positive relationship with food. Yeah. For so many people, they try to follow the keto diet to change their shape and size, and it causes disorder around food. I would encourage her to read Health at Every Size because we can be very healthy and pursue health at any size. Yeah, she's it's very chat. Sorry. She's read a book by the Unesco Young Food Weight Loss Guide. Oh, yeah. I would, I would give you some reading material for her or some podcasts for her to listen to because it sounds like she, she would benefit from some, some more peaceful ideas. Yeah. Uh, thank you for coming today. You're uh, welcome. I had a question. How do you feel about carb cycling? Carb cycling? Mm -hmm. As like a body recomposition factor, I guess. As a body what? Like a body recomposition. I'm not even sure about, car like, I'm not sure if you would have to tell me more about carb cycling. I, honestly, I don't really stay in the fad diet world because there's so many of them. Okay, so this doesn't exactly answer your question, but I think it's an important point to make, is that with athletes who are using food in ways like you're talking about, 
The important thing to pay attention to is that if you are using food in those ways to impact performance, that's an okay thing to do. If you're using food in those ways to change your body's shape or size, we're starting to wonder, to be a little, let's be careful. But as far as carbs, um, I mean, so I would say that. I can't necessarily speak to the carbs and performance. I'm not a sports dietitian. Um, I will say that you will crave carbohydrate when you're being more physically active because carbohydrates are that main source of energy and they are the only nutrient that run your brain and your spinal cord. So carbs are really important. I, I don't feel like, I know, I've, I'm not a sports nutritionist, so I don't feel like I can totally answer your question, but yeah, you're welcome. Uh, all right, um, so my question would be more like, um, so you talk about body image and how like that could be bad to be thinking about, but um, some body types, uh, could actually be like more susceptible to certain diseases. Like so midsection belly fat is associated with uh, type two diabetes and stuff like that. So what do you say like to people who like, yeah, they're not chasing a certain like body weight, but to trim up their midsection would be actually a healthier thing for them. Um, can I advance this backwards? It's not going backwards. I think that, I mean, look at this culture we live in, right? It's okay to wish that you could lose weight or that you could lose your midsection. But we have to go back to what I said earlier about in weight research, we know how to help people lose that but not maintain it. So when we help them lose it through dieting, we know within two to five years it's gonna come back and possibly even more. So what we see is that as far as people's health, Losing weight and gaining it and losing weight and gaining it is worse for their health than staying at a higher weight. We know that that is true now. Your doctor might not tell you that because not all doctors are up on current weight research, unfortunately. Doctors get maybe one nutrition class and doctors promote a lot of fad diets, okay? So I said to him, health at every size. So health at every size doesn't mean we are healthy at every size, but we can pursue health at any size. So someone who has a belly that doesn't wanna get diabetes, they are people who can tap into joyful movement, maybe take a 10 minute walk after lunch, 10 minute walk after dinner, if they are, if that fits with their health goals. It depends for every person. Um, another question submitted online. How do you feel about dieting pills? Not a good thing. <coughs> you, not a good thing, but that's my perspective. Um, another one submitted. If someone grew up in a household where food restriction and shaming was consistent or con consistent pushed, how can they revert from that and develop healthier food habits? Um, so multiple ways. I mean, there's, um, there's lots of different podcasts I would recommend they, live, they, they listen to. I would get intuitive eating and read intuitive eating. Um, if you're someone who doesn't want to read and doesn't want to do a podcast, I mean, I'm always here as a resource and can work it, at making peace with food with you. But um, body shaming and food restriction is a reality for all of us because of what our culture is like. And there are many circles where we are working at peace with food and body and tapping into those is gonna help with um, recovery and with po more positive perspective. Hi, thank you so much for speaking. Um, I have a two part question. Okay. Um, is this mostly prevalent in America or does it extend beyond the United States? And do you have any suggestions for how to combat diet culture in our day to day life? So it definitely extends beyond the US. Um, of course, all of these places that have become more westernized because of our influence um, have more body image struggles. Um, they've done studies where cultures who don't have TV in the house have TV and within a very short time, they're thinking negatively about their bodies. Um, so yes, Australia is also another place where there's a lot of body image work being done. Um, and so, yeah. Lots of places this is an issue. What was the second part of your question? 
How do we combat diet culture? How do we combat diet culture? Um, so there's lots of ways. I mean, in your group of friends, you can try to start educating them. There's, um, you can say, let's have a not, no negative talk about bodies or no shaming of foods policy in our friend group. That's one way. Um, you can, like there's, like I said, social media has been really powerful in getting this message out and you can follow some of those accounts and share things that people are saying on social media uh, because diet culture is a really harmful thing. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Yep. Um, 